Okay, welcome back. Uh, this is the we're going to do the next lecture for Unit Six, which is the lecture, the second lecture on painting. If you remember our first lecture on painting, we talked about the three media that were most common in the ancient world leading up to the Renaissance, and that was fresco, encaustic painting, and tempera painting. And so for the the second lecture, we're going to be talking about watercolor and with watercolor gouache. And we're going to be talking about oil painting and then also acrylic and just in general related to acrylic, just sort of 20th century painting uh, or paints in general. But before we do that, I had just I had just like one minute left of what I was talking about with Velasquez when I got cut off. I apologize to that. I thought I could get it all in, in one minute. And what I wanted to say about Velasquez is that in some ways you can see his hand is more gestural. Um, and in a way, in a very kind of agitated almost way, uh, more gestural than Rubin's hand. But his composition and his drawing tends to be much more kind of calm and restrained. And it's a, it gives an interesting balance to Velasquez. Like with Rubin's painting, it's gestural, but it's kind of a languorous uh, type of gesture, very kind of like based off of kind of like these fluid cross contour lines, very calligraphic in its feel. But then the actions of the figures are often extremely um, expressive, you know, very much like uh, the Mannerist painters. And um, whereas Velasquez tended to pick compositions where the figures were seated or standing and were um, relatively restrained, but but the way he painted was much more kind of um, uh, aggressive and and gestural. So that's all I wanted to say. We'll talk more about Velasquez uh, later. Uh, remember, we did have a very long discussion about uh, La Meninas when we talked about um, the narrative impulse. So let's get started. Got to find my next uh, PowerPoint here. That would be this one, Survey of Painting. And we're going to start with From the Beginning. All right, so like I said, this lecture we're going to be covering um, the three more modern uh, paint mediums um, and also the ones that are more dominant in the world that we live in today. So uh, we're going to talk about watercolor first and as a very quick review of what we covered last time, remember that whenever we're talking about a painting uh, or different types of medium of painting, we're talking about the pigment. Pigments pretty much stay the same. That said, let me, that's not entirely true because some pigments work better in different mediums, but we're talking about a pigment, we're talking about a medium, and we're talking about a binder. Sometimes the medium and the binder are the same thing, sometimes they're not. Um, and also usually when we're talking about a painting, we're talking about a mount, whether that's a canvas or a panel or a piece of paper, the thing that the painting is done on, that's called a mount. So let's talk about watercolor. So um, painting with um, with pigment in you know in water is very very old, right? I mean, like as old as fresco at least, and we see examples of this in, in uh, Chinese ink painting, right? But true watercolors were not um, not really a thing until uh, until the Renaissance. What makes a watercolor a watercolor as opposed to other types of just water in um, watered solutions of pigment is that in a watercolor the the binder is gum arabic um, and so the uh, the pigment is kind of ground into the gum arabic first and then later on when the artist wants to work with it they wet it and they can then turn that into uh, watercolor one of the things that's interesting about watercolors because of that quality it can be re-wetted meaning that um, if you're working on a watercolor and you work on a section and you wanted to add more water to this area because you didn't like what you made, you can actually lift up the, uh, the paint, which is both a technical problem that watercolors have to deal with, but also a thing that they can use to their advantage, that ability to lift out pigment from, from a piece of paper as much as to put lay, uh, layers of, of paint down. Watercolor by its very nature is very transparent. So generally watercolors painting painters have to learn in a kind of an almost a, a reverse manner from most painters, where most painters will work by getting things pretty dark first and then adding lights. Watercolor painters have to reserve their lights, have to kind of like remember 
where they're going to keep the lightest values, right? And then paint everything else the darker colors to that. Um, so that's a kind of a difference. Now there is a very opaque version of watercolor, which is called gouache, which is very chemically very similar to watercolor. It also has gum arabic in it, um, but generally it has other additives, including some chalks and some other things to make it um, extremely opaque. And um, gouache is um, a pretty useful and an interesting medium. Uh, before the invention of watercolor, it was the only um, medium that really can make large areas of flat colors, flat opaque colors in a water-based uh, paint. Because um, temper is also slightly transparent. And the other thing, so one of the things about gouache is that gouache was the medium that was primarily used in design education um, in the 19th century and the early 20th century until um, acrylics not only were invented, but until they became popular enough that they kind of replaced uh, gouache for that purpose. But still, there are still people who teach design classes with gouache. One of the advantages with gouache compared to acrylic is that when you paint with acrylics, the colors change as they dry, whereas that does not happen in gouache. So, okay, here are some contemporary artists who are use watercolor as well as use watercolor and gouache. Um, we have a piece by Cecily Brown and Elizabeth Payton. Uh, Cecily Brown um, generally works in large scale uh, oil paintings, but she also does some work at these kind of small uh, drawing scales with with watercolors. Um, Elizabeth Payton primarily works in acrylics, but she also uh, does works in, in watercolor. I actually like her watercolors, I think, better than her acrylic paintings. They're, they're very open and loose. Okay, so let's talk about oil painting. So if you remember from the last lecture, we'd already kind of covered the fact that oil painting was invented out of tempera painting, that it was this kind of slow transition where artists realized more and more that they could both add layers of oil varnishes to the top of tempera paintings, but they could also, at later stages, add oil to tempera paint to make it uh, slower drying and more glossy, and that eventually people realized, oh, you know, you could just take the pigment and grind it straight into linseed oil and make oil paint that way. Um, and like I've said before, Jan van Eyck is definitely the painter who was right there at that moment, um, but I resist calling him the inventor of oil painting because we have no direct proof of that. Um, and then some of the oil painting that we've seen since the Jan van Eyck, um, and we saw Renaissance paintings such as uh, some great painting by Durer and, and obviously the, the great paintings by Raphael and by Del Sarto and by Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and then we get to the Venetian painters, and it's really with Titian and the Venetian painters, but especially with Titian himself, that we have sort of like this combination of the Northern European tradition of oil painting and the desire to use oil painting to get really, really rich and dark values, rich colors, dark values, and strong value contrasts, right? To get all that um, into a painting, but also kind of keeping a lot of the other aspects of um, of Renaissance painting. And we see that in, in Titian. But then also with Titian, we see more and more as he develops his career, he starts to understand the potential of oil painting as a medium that allows for just for the same kind of um, amount of gesture and mark making that you have in drawing. He finds that you can find that also in painting, in oil painting. And so in the late career um, Titian, like the flaying of Marcius here, we really see a very kind of extreme, super gestural uh, way of painting, using lots of layers, but also a lot of dry brushing, a lot of very active mark making. Um, an amazing, extraordinary painting. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit more about um, that, his influence, um, in the next part. All right, see you.